Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles. We win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Hey, what's going on, Trailblazers fans? This is the Blazers Edge podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you're looking for your podcast needs. I am your co-host, Dan Morang, as always, joined by the Tra- Blazers Edge managing editor, Dave Deckard. Well, this has kind of been a weird week, Dave, and we had a little bit of an impromptu podcast over the weekend with some things that popped up here, and it's it's definitely sparked a discussion about media and integrity and the the gray areas, blue lines, whatever you want to call it, and, and Neil O'Shea and, and how that's kind of shaped over the past. We aren't going to get real too, real deep into it right now, but what's kind of been your takeaway now we're kind of stepped away from it for a few days? Yeah, I mean, I don't guess there's that much more to say. Uh, of course, Ben Golliver and Isaac Rupp joined us over the weekend to talk about it. I think some people are still in denial a little bit about it. To me, the silence speaks volumes uh, from, from everywhere. If this were if this were torn out of the blue and were completely inaccurate, there would be a huge, massive outcry. There's not people are kind of looking at each other, kind of nodding silently. You know that that says something. I suppose the big takeaway for me, uh, and I think for everyone, should be the the question is less what happened to Isaac or what didn't happen to Isaac or the details or whatever, is the question of do we have independent media or not? And yes, people are contractually intertwined. We know that that may be an issue when you're talking basically. There are a couple major outlets that are classified as media and credentials and have that public face in this town. And CSN and W is one of them. And which side of the fence are we all on? I mean, I know the lines are blurred in 2017, but at the same time, there's still an implicit assumption that media is going to be independent. Somebody says something that it probably can be taken as uh, it's not just truth, but a vantage point on the truth that that opens up possibilities, that, that allows for fair discussion, that does all that stuff. And, you know, if, if you're afraid the ax is over your head, if you say certain things, I think that betrays our notion of media a little bit. Uh, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. I don't want to offer, you know, criticisms or implications of any reporters or any network or whatever. All I am saying is this absolutely brings up those questions and these are not questions in this day and age that we should take lightly but you know hey it's it's there's more to the blazers than neil olshay and his proclivities and and the broadcast of them the blazers actually have played a few games since we last talked uh they had a bounce back game a wonderful win dan against the horners hornets they <laughs> turned the corner and then immediately horners. lost to Yes, they immediately lost to the Mavericks at home and then went out and lost to the Oklahoma City Thunder. What do you make of all this? Uh, That Hornets game? Is there anything to make of all this? You know, let's start with Charlotte. That that Hornets game was the first game I went to this season where I just took it in. Like, for people that don't know, I go to a metric ton of games. Um, not as many this year because of scheduling, but I, it's literally hundreds and hundreds and probably upwards of thousands of games that I've been to now. 
And for the first time in a long time, I literally just kind of sat in my seat and just took the game in. And it was a great game to do that with because by the time the third quarter rolled around, I could just kind of turn my mind off and enjoy it. Um, which honestly is the first time I think I've been able to do that all season. And, and I think that was indicative of not just my my situation, but the way the Blazers played and how poorly the Hornets uh, performed. And, you know, it was one of those things where you look at that and it probably looked a lot better than it really was because this is the same Hornets team that had beaten Portland by what? 22, like a week before 10 days before. So I think both those games were kind of aberrations for both teams where both teams and one on each opportunity just got crazy hot while the other team just didn't care while they were on the road. And that's what happens when the NBA, um, so it, it was it was nice, but I, I've I've gotten to the point where I'm not talking about get right games anymore. Like I, I don't Here. there's there's no get right game left for me on this season. I've had too many of the this is a turn the corner get right. This is what's gonna help now. You need to get like ten of those before I even like bat an eye at it at, the, at this point. Well, here's the thing about the Hornets and the question I have of the of the larger scheme. The Hornets are basically similar to the Blazers in certain ways, at least offensively, except they only have one star guard scoring in their backcourt instead of two. The Hornets are kind of like the Blazers would be if there were no C.J. McCollum. They've got people like Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, uh, you know, Nicola Batum, Marvin Williams, that are kind of multi-purpose guys can defend some, the kind of analogs to Aminu and, and Harkless, but they don't score. So basically you have one job. You watch Kemba Walker, and they're not going to be able to score enough to, to get past you. And that's what the Blazers did. It was great. Like, bravo, 115 to 98. That's exactly what that should have looked like. But then now you get to the Mavericks, who have <laughs> similar makeup now that Dirk Nowitzki just turned 113 years old, and the, you have one guy that you got to watch, it's Harrison Barnes, and, and you kind of watched him, you limited him to 13 points, but Yogi goes for 32, Wes Matthews goes to 27, Seth Curry has 19. What happened? You had one job, and they weren't even, even though the Mavericks kind of, they like to kind of walk it down and then shoot that mid-range or three-point jumper. I mean, it's not like they're going to really pound you in the in the lane. And for God's sake, they're usually not going to fast break. I mean, so what did you have to worry about? It's uh, They scored 20 points in the paint. They scored five fast break points, and they beat you. What you had one job. What happened that was different against Dallas than one was against Charlotte? That game was a flaming dumpster fire of awfulness. Uh, it's just we're sitting up there in the media section, and Yogi is just canning three after three, and everybody up there we're we're sitting there laughing in utter shock. Like he's not going by you. They're not running a pick and roll. He's literally walking into threes. You should think. The hyperbole that came from this, from everybody that was sitting there looking at each other in utter shock, like, this isn't highbrow stuff here. He's walking in and canning it. When he's six of seven and three, maybe it's time to get a hand up on the guy's face. He's all a six foot tall. They weren't doing anything that was crazy. That's what was mind blowing. It's, It's not like... They're running a backside pick and roll, and they're everybody's just completely sagging off and taking Harrison Barnes and Dirk away and making Yogi Ferrell beat them. He's catching and shooting or stepping into it. It, it, it. There was there was nothing about that game or that game plan that said, you know, we're gonna go. Heck, their own head coach Rick Carlisle before the game, you know, he he says we're a blanking team, you know, insinuating a bad team. And but we're an underrated blank team. I mean, they they know that they aren't overloaded with talent, and yet they come out and just absolutely run Portland off the floor in the first half. So I, I I have no idea how to wrap my head around what that game was. Do you think the Blazers are still expecting to win games at this point? It has to be the case. Twenty-two and thirty. 
I mean, uh, 22 and 30, how do you, I mean, does it not sink in at some point that you actually have to work for them, that you can't come out in the first quarter and spot the other guy like a, a 15 point, point lead and then come back and win it? I, I'm going to have to do some research on this because it's a little bit harder to parse out. You can't just run it through like basketball reference or anything like that. You actually had to run it through a, through the play by play trackers, but I'd be willing to bet that Portland has been down by more in the first quarter for longer periods of time than any team in the league. Like I, I don't, I don't understand how you can constantly come out so flat. Like it, it, it's just one of those things. Okay. Like, you 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 talk about how we need to do all the right things and you get all the clichés post game we got to come out with more energy like i i can at least understand where they were coming out with more energy and they just weren't hitting shots or they were committing a ton of fouls or whatever the case but you look at them and it, every one of these guys out there that looks like they just ate you know a, a loaf of sweet bread and washed it down with a gallon of milk and decided yeah, I got about 20 minutes before I can really do anything. So you guys handle business. So I, It's crazy, man. Well, I can tell you that Portland is 27th in the league in first quarter score margin and basically deficit. Um, they're pretty good at, at scoring in the first quarter, 27.6, but they are Dead last in points at allowed. 29.3 in points allowed. Uh, 29.3 encroaching upon 30 points per game. Um, that's insane. Brooklyn is right. That's so yeah, Brooklyn's crazy. right there with them. 30 points. Like, yeah. The, the, the mantra of like every NBA coach is no 30 point quarters. And the first quarter is arguably the most important quarter for setting tone and tempo in the NBA. And you're averaging almost 30 points a game given up. That's it's one of the it's, worst stats that I think I could possibly imagine for a team to have. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty bad. Fourth quarter point, I think the story gets better. Uh, they're only they're 19th in the league. But you know what? If you're going to be 30th in the first quarter, you better be like second or third at least in the fourth quarter. And the thing and, is, that, that's uh, only yeah. making up ground. That's, that's getting you back in the game. It's not whereas teams that are really good in the fourth quarter typically are closing out games. This is them making up all the ground that they gave up. Whereas if they were just slightly better in the first quarter, those fourth quarter gains would be an actual net positive. Yeah. Well, you know, the Blazers are, are decent to average in points allowed. Now, keep in mind, this isn't pace adjusted. So uh, a lot of teams that go slower just don't allow or score as many points are going to register higher than Portland on this scale. I get that. At the same time, there's a difference and a marked difference between the Blazers' second and fourth quarters, which are average to decent. I mean, they might even be good considering the amount of points scored in your typical Blazers game, whereas the first and third quarters are bad. And, uh, you know, it might say something about the starting lineup there. Uh, it obviously says something about the defense. But, I mean, yeah, it, basically, long story short, think of every team that you think really, really stinks in <laughs> in the league and the Blazers allow more points than all of them. They, they start worse, defensively at least, than every single one of them. Lakers, Minnesota, doesn't matter who. <clears throat> it, it's pretty rough. This isn't the team that can can afford to spot leads. And that's what they're doing yeah, essentially every single night. Yeah. It's like, hey, here's a five-point lead. Go get them. <laughs> so, uh, thunder thunder game i mean is that just westbrook is that just gonna happen or was there something uniquely about the blazers you saw that contributed to the to the loss it was two things it was westbrook he has these games where he is going to gun from mid-range they happen otherwise he's i think he's normally about 38 37 percent shooter from that area it's just that what makes him so ridiculously effective from that range is that when he gets to that spot, you have to pick your poison. And if he gets hot from there, he gets dumb hot. Uh, he, he is absolutely in fuego. He's Gordon Ramsay in the kitchen, just nuts. But he swears? Yes. 
Absolutely. <laughs> Fairly certain he was chewing. I think it. I think it was Aminu after he spun him around in a circle where he asked him where he was going three times with profanity and in between it. I'm not gonna lie. I laughed a little bit because he absolutely broke Al off. So, um, but what he does to modern NBA defenses is turn them on their head. He's taking a shot that ultimately you don't want to give up, but if you're going to concede one, that's the one that's that's least valuable in, in terms of points per shot. The problem is when he gets rolling like that, it takes the entire defensive game plan and blows it apart. And you have to decide if you're going to push out on him and keep him from then getting into the paint with no help behind you. Wessel Westbrook, you don't have to explain to people, is arguably the most explosive player in the past 25 years. So if you're going to wall him off, you have to make sure everybody's there. The problem that I saw with the Blazers was that they were conceding that jumper, even though he kept getting it. But at the same time, and this is, when I say conceding, it's a very, very loose term because the Blazers don't, no NBA team concedes anything. That's just the area that they're, they're least concerned with. Now, the thing is, is that Portland opted to back off of that in order to help rebound. Well, here's the thing. The Blazers didn't rebound either. They got absolutely annihilated on the boards. So if you're not going to rebound, you might as well try to force the ball out of, out of Westbrook's hands. And you're, you're looking at the checklist of things that you need to do to beat the Thunder. Keep them out of the paint. Keep them off the board. Stop them from fast breaking. That's basically your one, two, three of how to beat the Thunder. Yeah. And, well, look... I may not be a head coach, but even I know that you don't get to rebound shots to go in. So <laughs> at some point it becomes a problem. But here's my thing. The Blazers, and I haven't, I haven't actually looked this up, which I probably should, but it's my perception anyway, that the Bla- when the Blazers start having a lot of trouble, they're giving up points in the middle of the floor. And it doesn't matter who the opponent is too much if, if the Blazers' middle gets soft, and by the middle of the floor, I mean take a line, take the key, extend it out to the three-point line, and they leave a lot of people open or single card in mismatches in that spot, and it's just automatic that they're going to score there. I would be a lot happier if... I, I want to lose from the edges. I mean... It, it, there's an argument to be made for not giving up corner threes. I get it. Um, I guess I would concede that you need to send a guy out there. But if a team beats me from angles shooting, I'm great. But it makes me a little upset to see even Russell Westbrook, even though you call it mid-range, from him right around that key area, just straight on again and again and again and again, and you just don't stop it, something's really wrong there. Yeah, and it... It's not like Westbrook got hot from three and you just kind of live with it. This he's, he's like Chris Paul in that he's going to shoot from one of two places. It's going to be the elbow or he's going to dunk on your soul. I mean, with, with, with Chris Paul, it's not a dunk, it's a layup. But th- I mean, yes, they can step out and hit threes, but the, the, the shots that they want are on each elbow and at the rim because their unique ability in, in their, their quickness and their explosion and their passing ability and their finishing at the rim allow them to excel. And if, at least in my view, the best thing that Portland can do, and they, and they did it in the first matchup, was run Westbrook off and make him get rid of the ball. I think he ended up with like 15 point, 15, five and five, something along those lines for his stat line in Portland. You, you basically yeah, dared I'm... the Thunder not anyone on the Thunder, not named Russell Westbrook to beat you. And that to me seems like the best way to go about it. But it, it, it was just, yeah, that's, that's, it is weird. That's the way everybody goes about it. I mean, he, he is, we must admit, he is the leading scorer in the league. Oh, he's phenomenal. So a lot of people try this. Many people don't. Uh, many people fail. But yeah, it could have been a little harder. But, you know, I'm, hey, I baptize people. I know I'm not dunking on your soul. But in any <laughs> case, let's talk about other soul rending, soul rending performances. We can't leave this alone without going back to Yogi. I mean, you've described what it was like. You get a feel for how much it hurts. But, you know, every time I see a guy like that on a 10-day contract, unknown guard, excel, I think. And this is you know you're watching a Portland game? 
<laughs> yeah, well, okay, stop. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, oh, from the side with the uh, dagger. Oh, I'll need that sewn up after the podcast. Uh, in any case, yes, I'm a Portland game. And also, I can't help think that their demise or whatever you want to call it would not be quite as severe if some of those guys that Portland had that were analogous. Let's. We will invoke the name of Tim Frazier. We will invoke the name of Patty Mills. Where are those guys? And if the Blazers still had them, I mean, obviously there were other issues that were bigger, but it doesn't help that even the underpinnings are kind of soggy and uh, and prone to collapse. Yeah, it's kind of weird how the, these guys that. They turn into these fan favorites, but they're also really reliable. Um, are the ones that kind of get away. Um, so it's it's kind of it's hard to to really look at that and understand how that, because the the player movement at that level is so fluid. It's hard to really understand what you're getting from value on guys like that. Speaking of value, I'm sitting here talking right now and the screen flashes Will Barton's line of 31 and five tonight. That's cute. Um, oh Lord. <laughs> well, you know, I, we should, we at least say, let's get to Barton in a minute. Now Frazier's okay. He's slumping a wee bit. Uh, he's, he's only scoring nine points a game this year as his, his, his shooting percentages are off. Maybe that doesn't hurt quite so much but patty mills has had a wonderful time in san antonio he's a like fantastic anybody backup doesn't. point guard i mean he may yeah. ultimately be the best backup point guard in the nba right and i mean i guess i haven't looked i should probably look but my impression is that neither the pelicans the pelicans at least aren't spending a billion dollars for frazier right no. i'm not sure what i can look up mills here real quick but would the Blazers be better off if they had one of those players back? Was it mis a mistake letting him go? Yeah, I, mean, I think Portland's kind of trying to hope to, to 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 catch lightning in a bottle for a third time with a guy like Napier, and they may not have lucked out. Um, I, I like Shabazz. I love his energy and his speed and his hustle. And I, I mean, the the guy has. He, some of the, some of the, the ballsiest oh, okay. shot taking got, mentality I've ever seen. I'm sorry, I gotta stop you. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> are are we are we are we finding the, the contract but, numbers? But Patty is Patty is shooting 44 percent from three point land. I mean, he's not scoring. <laughs> I mean, it's ten points a game. I get it, but four four percent from the three point arc. Yes, but he's, he's also he's coming making... in for all those times that Tony Parker sits out a game and running uh -huh. that team. Right, but forty-four percent is incredible. He's making three point six million dollars this year. He's up for a new contract, but I don't think he's going to get Alan Crab level money. But uh, yeah, I'm I, okay. I've got a case of the sads now. Let's let's go to Will, let's go to Will Barton, the people's champ. Will make make you happy all the time. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and caveat it this way: if you can't find room in your heart for Will Barton, you're dead to me. Uh, Will Barton what? is. Everything good about basketball encapsulated in a six foot five, springy, incredibly rail thin body. Uh, that dude is, and, and I'm not sitting here claiming that I knew Will was going to turn into this phenomenal sixth man of the year candidate. I always thought he was a solid player. Ball handling skills could definitely get up and dunk on some people. Um, his energy, his athleticism, his, his, his basketball IQ, his basketball acumen has always been through the roof. You don't rebound that well at that size without truly understanding how angles and shot location and where you need to be on the floor at, you know, 190 pounds. And that may be giving him a few pounds. <laughs> so, well, you know, the thing about Will, he, he's not quite everything you want a basketball player. He can't defend. But uh, other than that, uh, which may be a serious omission on Portland squad, but... <laughs> He, too, shooting, pushing 40% from three-point arc, 45% for the field, 13 points a game, rebounds, creates all kinds of trouble. Uh, he's basically a shooting guard uh, who can change the game off the bench. 
As we saw tonight with 31 points, five rebounds, and five assists. $3.5 million a year for <laughs> Will Barton. He's also going to make more in a couple years, but again... That's a value contract you'd kill to have right about now, huh? Uh, <laughs> well, see, we're going to drive Laser's Edge editor Chris Lucia crazy here because, okay, he loves crab. He also loved Barton. Which is it? <laughs> Which you, who you got, Chris? We got to pose that question. Well, I'm sure he'll respond. You to could the comments, legitimately but... make an argument where you could run Crab at a three and Barton at a two. Oh, now you're making you, it even you could more go sad, small but... with that lineup because that lineup, if you wanted to run Dame or CJ at the point, that lineup would be a nightmare for teams to handle offensively. Yeah. Um. So, well, let's put that to you then, Dan. You can have one: Alan Crab or Will Barton. <sighs> And it's factor in salaries. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that's the thing is, that, is Krebs' salary and, and his, he's a pure shooter, but Krebs can create off the bounce, or uh, Barton can create off the bounce. He's cheaper. The defense really isn't that different between the two because Will, he'll get after you. He's not as consistent as Crab can be, but he's got the wingspan and the athleticism to stay with a lot of guys. And it, I, I want to give more credit to guys that are bigger, stronger, faster, and and all that, and being able to bang. But that's just not today's NBA. Will was created for today's NBA, and I, I mean, you look at what he's doing, not just tonight, but you, the entirety of last season for Denver. I think what he finished second or third for six man of the year. <sighs> Barton is a guy. He should that, have been six man of the year. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I argued that a couple of times. Um, and don't get me wrong, I like crap. I really do. Yeah, I think he's still rounding into form, but I think you get obviously you get more for less, but I think you get a lot more just because of what being able to create off the bounce means in today's NBA. Yeah, I mean, I can, I guess, I can kind of understand the argument that Crab fits a little better if you go with, if you go with Damon CJ in the backcourt, and where, what are you going to do with Barton? But you know what, pressure would never stop. Then you know, it, it's, if you if you kept Barton uh, coming off the bench, you have a legitimate uh, scorer. Obviously, you have a guy that other people have to legitimately fear. Could use one of those off the bench. Uh, I I suppose at this point I'd go with Barton too. We touched on this a little bit. I think I can't remember how much, but uh, let's say it again. Those those value contracts under the new CBA that the Blazers signed just are not looking like that great of value. I mean, it depends on talent, but you got to remember too. You know, eighteen point five million. I'm not on Crab, but his is the biggest one. That's still eighteen point five million that someone's got to pay for this player, no matter what percentage it is of the cap. I mean, most teams aren't below the cap floor anyway. They're all spending a reasonable amount of money, uh, and, and it's like eighteen point five million is a lot of that reasonable, <laughs> and, and it it just still seems like a salary to me that goes to someone who dramatically changes the game more often than not the Blazers are playing that slightly less for players that just don't do that yeah and that kind of goes back I mean, when, to the, the, the crux of that those kinds of arguments in that how this whole thing is is going to play out um, I mean we can run down the, the list and the litany of, of of moves that have been made basically since 2014-15 and it's just so hard to to parse it all out and how Portland has it's hard to justify it. Yeah, it's I like, mean, we Blazer fans have been now we haven't to be fair, uh, we have not been in the business of justifying it. We've critiqued it more than most. But this is is this worse than even you expected? <sighs> Man. I I don't know just because I you know, when the signings were all kind of finalized and made public, I looked at those and I was just so frustrated that it that lowered my expectations for everything for this year and, and going forward. Because while so many people kept calling about hey, their tradable assets, their tradable assets, the the crab contract and the and the Turner contracts to me were just so bad that I couldn't understand like what market they would be viable pieces in. 
this bad though? This bad? Did you? Did you? Really, I mean, twenty-two and thirty. I mean, let's let's look at game. Let's talk. About, I would probably call a criteria. three or four game difference. I mean, when, okay. when we when we've sat Fair. down and talked before the season started, I, I put the low on the team for thirty-seven wins. I think I had the high at forty forty-five. I think that was the window that I kind of operating. I didn't think they would. Achieve, I thought meeting or breaking the wins from last year were the most impressive thing possible for them that going into this year. I just didn't think they were going to do that much. So, but the way things have gone, yeah, it's it's crazy. And now, I mean, we went from a consolidation trade is definitely happening at the deadline. Remember that was that was what was basically circulating. To now we're looking at it like, well, Portland doesn't have the assets necessary to move to make a deal the deadline, so we have to wait till the summer. And it's wait just, till the summer for what? Yeah. To let Mason Plumley go because you don't want to pay him thirty six million dollars on a twelve million dollar contract. Yeah, uh, and that's the God thing forbid, is fifteen. Yeah, do you he, realize, if you do don't you resign that? him now, <laughs> he's gone. You're not getting anything for him. And remember, you gave up a late draft pick in Ronnie Hollis Jefferson for him. So, Here's I mean, that, that's, a, that's another if, sunk cost that you're not getting a return on. You realize that if someone offers Mason Plumley $13 million a year, the Blazers, if they don't make any other moves to cut their tag, they're going to pay like three times. They're going to pay $50 million in the salary and tax penalty for Mason Plumley. There's no way you can do that. That's that's what – it's it's a disaster in that sense. I mean, like – your hands are tied. You can't do the things that, that you would need to do. But let's, 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 I want to go back to this criteria of, of game changers. Now, we, talk, we know Barton has changed some games, okay? Uh, hard to put a number on how many, but he's at least known around the league for, for doing this, okay? How many games, for instance, has Alan Kraft changed this year? I can think of maybe three. I was going to say three, four, or, three or four for certain. It's yeah. probably... Probably five or six, if you want to talk about legitimate impact. Now, I'm not, I'm, what I'm here's what the distinction I want to make. We as observers c- compare this on a curve to expectation to the player's normal performance, et cetera, et cetera. So, for instance, we will say about Mason Plumley. Mason Plumley had a really nice game, and that's accurate. Or Mason Plumley had the best games of his season. That's accurate. That's different than saying. Mason Plumley took this game by the throat and throttled a win out of it. Excuse the violent metaphor, but you know what I mean. It's, it's like just absolutely he did this. He changed it. Damian Lillard changes games. Yes, we know that. C.J. McCollum changes games. Yes, we know that. At the same time, it feels like a lot of teams have that, or the good teams, I should say, have those other players besides their stars who you legitimately fear can come in and twist this game in a way you did not expect and really take it over and win it, not with scoring, with defense or something else. So Alan Crabb, I, I would say five would be way generous. I, I still want to stick with three, maybe four if my memory is faulty. Mason Plumley, I mean, I think he's two. I mean, he's had some great performances. I don't want to slight him at all. But the games that Mason Plumley won for this team, two on the outside, al Farouk Aminu, maybe a couple? He's had a couple games but, where his defense was otherworldly and he was sure. hitting threes. But remember, we've only had 22 wins, so there can't be – I mean, you know, and Tame and CJ have claimed some of them. Yeah. But – but so I mean, beyond that, Harkless is, hasn't had a, a game where he's taken over or anything along those lines. He's I had, think he uh, might have one. I mean, it's good. You he's know. had plenty right, of consistent efforts, and that's the thing is like, there, there's plenty of guys that have have averaged their stat line, basically, for stretches, but like full on takeover game where they were the instrumental point in in deciding whether or not the Blazers won or lost. Yeah, there's probably maybe twelve. No, nah, that's probably too high. It's probably 8 to 10 between everybody not named Damon CJ. And where you feared them. That's that. I mean, you know what I mean? We talked yeah. about this with Damon. All that's target. what I mean. Where, like, they just got you, you, dumb you just hot for, for, for some reason. 
or made you go when walked on the floor or made the next team go, whoa, we better cope for this uh, with this guy. We have to game plan for this guy. If you look at the guys the Blazers, the, the opponents have to game plan for in any way, shape, or form outside of Damian and CJ, they do not exist on this roster, and that's a problem. Not that they're not in the scouting report. Everybody's in the scouting report in one way or another, right? But literally, guys, where you go, we have to take care of this guy or we're in danger tonight. That is Damian Lillard, that's CJ McCollum, and Lillard, th- th- they will live with everything else everyone else does. And Mills and, and Barton and, and are, are guys that well, you want yeah. on your roster because those are guys on a nightly basis. Patty Mills has killed this team already once this year. I mean, right. th- th- well, those, are, those are guys that... You have to you have to worry about Will Barton going for thirty points on a night. You, those are legitimate things where Will's like in the, the Jamal Crawford mold in that on the scouting report it basically says don't let him get rolling because he can go into takeover mode. He's Jamal Crawford, Nate Robinson, one of those kind of guys that you will just go ham. Outside of Damon CJ, there's nobody here. It's it, if they get absolutely red hot they're, they they scare opponents i think that's that's a good qualifier to that you put on that like, it, it it's not just in the scouting report but it, it's a legitimate fear a healthy fear that opponents have when they play the blazers it's like it's not ham it's pressed turkey at best you know it's yeah. that floppy stuff they get in a bad deli sandwich now okay alan crab is shooting 44 percent from the three-point arc I, i'll believe that but alan crab i think has a has a bigger bar to clear just because he has to be set up and he has to be in his right spot uh, in order to to score big. And, you know, I I would say, okay, is the impact of Patty Mills bigger than the impact of Alan Crabb? No, it's not. I think they're about equal. The difference, of course, being, again, you're paying $3.5 million for one of those and $18.5 million for the other one. Was that a, was that a billion in there? 18.5 18. Yeah, well, billion? Yeah, <laughs> well... Billions and Carl Sagan. <laughs> yes. Carl Sagan, we need to resurrect him or rerun some tapes so that we can deal with the Blazers salary cap situation. Or Robin you Leach. know, we're yeah, okay. <laughs> well, the Blazers, the Blazers all qualify for <laughs> lifestyles of the rich famous. We're dating ourselves with, with that reference. Yeah, In I any know. case, uh, since it is the trade deadline, since we're talking about shooting guards and players, you know, that, that might make a difference off the bench. Let's revisit something that happened a couple years ago. It also connects to Will Barton, the Aaron Aflalo trade. And I want to bring this up around the trade deadline simply because one of the internal arguments on our staff, and we have many of them, it's delightful. <laughs> if people only knew how much we argued. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> It is like whatever goes on in the comment section cranked up to 11, except nobody nobody really goes ad hom or gets everybody's really respectful. But, yeah, it's freaky. In any case, yeah, do not look at your Slack. You could tell, like, okay, we're on Slack, and, uh, you know, the phone's set to buzz when you get a notice. And it's like every once in a while my phone just goes like earthquake. And I know, oh, Lord, somebody brought up a topic. I, you know, it's like, is that news? Oh, no. Or, somebody or you read that first line you're like, nope, <laughs> like, no, I can't, I can't. I'm going to go down the argument for the next two hours. I have to go do real stuff. And then get back in their 800 comments to parse to Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, one of the things our staff is split on uh, Aaron Aflalo trade two years ago this month the Blazers trade away Will Barton they trade away oh what Victor Claver or who and uh, yeah, draft first pick, round that, pick first round pick there was something else in there the pick didn't turn out to be much yet uh, <laughs> Will Barton turned out to be a little bit of something uh, obviously Claver didn't either so uh, but revisit that trade there are some people who think that move was absolutely justified the right move cannot be argued with there are other people who think that move was one of the bigger disasters to beset the french franchise that was not injury injury related that was a voluntary disaster where do you fall on that i'm kind of splitting hairs on this one because i get the idea and this is if you if no, you no, if, no, no you can't no you no, can't no, no, let me, let me, hold on hold on hold on I, I I'm gonna go one way before I go back to the other this is what I do all right so if you're operating under the assumption that 
Neil O'Shea knew that LaMarcus wasn't leaving. And, oh, and you're going to bring that up? Well, the, 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 to me, it, to me, it frames it. Was, to he, me, it frames the whole deal. He didn't know if he was leaving. There's criminal negligence. If he didn't at least suspect. But and that's, anyway, and that's where, where my, my point kind of goes here. If you, if you're in that camp to me, okay, sure. Then, then the, the idea of this whole thing makes sense because you're trying to make this push and you're trying to convince him that this team can make it happen. Now, I believe that that's fantasy world. Uh, it's it's one of those things. It's the difference between right now where a midseason trade, you're doing it for the future. That midseason trade was trying to do it for right now. That's the only way that I can say that the justification was necessary or okay. But if the, the world that I'm living in, he knew he was gone, and he mortgaged the future for a three-month rental of Aaron Aflalo, and that, to me, is one of the more ridiculous things I've seen a GM do in, in recent history. You gave away a young, controllable asset in Will Barton, a first-round pick. Claver is Claver. I, I, I like him. He's one of those guys where you, you expect more from him, but it, it's whatever. But if you're thinking Thomas about Austin rebuilding a team up. coming How up... How we forget he Rob? He went. Oh, there you go. There's the other one. So, but if you're thinking about rebuilding a team and you know basically that Aldridge is gone, why on earth are you giving up a first round draft pick and Will Barton for a three month rental? Here, here's where I'll qualify, and I, Dave, am saying this, and one of the ones with, with this story about Aldridge staying, leaving, or what have you. I don't believe that Olshay knew he was gone for sure. In fact, I interpret Aflalo as a move to try to change his mind. However, if if Olshay did not know that that was up in the air, if Olshay was certain that Aldridge was not going, then Olshay was blind. I mean, he was that's that's the criminal negligence, not that he traded so much in a stupid way because I think if he was 100% sure he was gone then he probably would not have made the Aflalo deal one would hope uh, but he had to know that that was a serious possibility and then this happened you know in the worst possible way for the Blazers I fall in the camp of yeah that was it was pretty bad uh, T-Rob and Claver aside fine those are players you thought maybe used to be talented especially robinson olshay traded for him right but the draft pick thank goodness it didn't turn out to be anybody maybe you could say there was prescience there knowing that that the, the lower half <laughs> hey, of the... let's remember the only reason that didn't turn out to be anything is because the blazers got so hot over two and a half months well i mean that okay that was true as well <laughs> but uh but, you know, you could say hey, the second half of the draft is weak. Uh, we don't believe that we're going to get anybody there. That I can all agree with. But the people's champ, I mean, I can't. That's just when the guy too much, right? away turns out to be that dynamic for a guy who was a three-month rental. And in context, it's part of the a litany of moves that were and have been questionable and continue to be questionable. The move of the oh, time that was... To me, okay, I, I, I get what you're trying to make to do with this push. The hindsight review of it, there is no, re- in my mind, there is no way to redeem that move. With, well, and with, the way, only with the way, way everything broke out. And the only way the non-hindsight is excusable is if you had zero foresight. If you're operating as we, you know, are as we analyze these things where we don't necessarily know the inner workings, although there were rumblings. But let's just assume that those didn't happen. So there, if there's zero chance that you know or suspect what's going to happen, okay, maybe then you can say, well, you're hindsight analyzing and blah, blah. But given the information at hand in the organization and the, the, the knowledge that should have been there, no, I, I think you have a hard time justifying that. So, but I think another key factor that, that plays into that, though, that people want to make the argument for the Aflalo deal, is I think a lot of people thought that that team really had a chance to go somewhere. And I think that's kind of legit because the Trailblazers themselves flip-flopped on that 
analysis. If the noise coming out of Laser Central for the entire, you know, couple years prior was, oh, this has a chance to be a special team. Look at what they're doing. We're building to something. Here we go. And all of a sudden, after Aldridge left, the story became, oh, no, that team was at the end, and the team wasn't really going anywhere. <laughs> uh, it was just one of the cases of whiplash that was going on during that tumultuous year. Which do you think it is? Do you, now, do you think that team really had a chance to be special with the Flalo Con? With, Hel Hel with healthy Wes, enough? with healthy Wes, I think that was a Western Conference Finals team. I, winning, I, winning conference finals? Do you think they would have won it? It's not a coin toss, but I, I think that they could have gotten there and you couldn't write them off. Let's put it that way. 4-2, uh, maybe 4-3. Um, can't and, write anybody no, off. No, but... No, but that, isn't that pushing it to not me? All that, not all conference finalists to me are created equal. Right. So I think that they, they had a puncher's chance um, with Wesley. It's just the way that that team was playing there was was pretty impressive in the couple of weeks before West went down. I mean, they were a good team, and then they became a great team there down the stretch before his Achilles popped. And well, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, that's that, that's I mean, oh. you can, let's, let's go ahead and stop and take a look at that team real quick. You've got Dame, Nick, Wes, Lamarcus, Robin. A Flalo, CJ Barton, uh, right. You don't have a Flalo and Barton. It's either or. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> you uh, have, I'm, I'm right, sorry. Yeah. Um, Barton's gone, but you, right. you've got right. McCollum Flalo, and Darrell a Flalo right. yeah. and Terrell Wright. Uh, man, that's that's a lot of firepower on that team. Yeah. I, I, I agree, although would CJ have emerged has had West remained healthy? And, and by the way, CJ have emerged. With West remain healthy, and you got Aaron Aflalo. I mean, why'd you get Aaron Aflalo then if you had CJ? Yeah, th that'll, that'll go on something else that I, I didn't want to bring up, but since you, you touched on it, remember the narrative that, oh, we knew CJ was going to be this guy all along? If that's your yeah. narrative, then why on earth did you trade for Aaron Aflalo? Well, yeah, because the narrative between the first act and the second act is like two different plays. But <laughs> look, you want to talk about a puncher's chance, though. Now, granted, had things gone well, they might not have faced up against the Grizzlies in the first round, but they might have met them somewhere along the way. And Memphis, this was the year, right, that they Memphis had just housed them like all year long. And the Blazers mustered one win out of five games in the playoff series. So there was like, there was a wall right there and the Blazers were paying for it uh, over and over again. Every time they played the Grizzlies. Yeah. But remember Lamarcus had <laughs> checked out at that point in time. I mean, but we, no, we, he didn't check out at the beginning of the series. There this were rumors the same heading into the playoffs oh. where he wasn't there. Like after Wes went down, it, it, that team emotionally was done and, you can see LaMarcus searching for his new home in Texas. Yeah, but what about the regular season wins then? The, the, the Blazers had problems with Memphis all year they long. They did have problems with them, but if I remember correctly, there were a couple games where I think, no, Dame wasn't out. I think Nick and somebody else were out. Yeah, I think, there was some injury, sure, but I mean. I, I, think, it, I think it was a bad, yeah. bad matchup as far as through most yeah. of the season, but I still... I, that team to me, when fully healthy, was incredibly dangerous. Uh, dangerous, okay. Conference finals winners that year or the year after. Maybe if CJ emerged, but then again, where's the logjam? I mean, right now, right now, would I like to have that lineup back? Oh, you bet I would with CJ McCollum in tow. And by the way, with Will Barton in tow, I will take that all day long compared to what they've had since. And by the way, you could make a couple. I think you could still get Mo Harkless if you really wanted him, for instance. But I mean, you can make yourself sick doing that. But at the I did time... That, I did that about a week ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran don't, down this I, entire I, thing, and it was face don't, melting. Don't, don't do the perfect uh, hindsight version of the... No, it's, uh, it's bad. It's really uh, so bad. anyway... I, I would say, no, the Flower Trade's a disaster, and that team was not, that team was good. That team was not 
destined to call it even a finals team for sure for me would stretching conference finals i believe they would have made it at some point and i believe they could have won then or there had they gotten there but not not that year and probably not the next all right let's uh close it up by heading uh to familiar grounds a little bit with just a different name philadelphia evidently wants to divest themselves of a center but it wasn't the center we thought about all along um jaleel okafer uh purportedly there are some hot talks between the sixers and the pelicans uh what do you hear and what do you make of that i mean well the sixers make up their mind first okafor is not tradable he's tradable he's on the market he's off the market he's happy he's sad Nerlens Noel is free to be, to be traded. Now he's Joel Embiid's best friend. I mean, good God, can these guys get a hold of one single narrative for at least a month? It's nuts. No, it's, it's endemic. NBA it's NBA so NBA. bad. Um, I well, be, uh, beyond that, that, beyond that kind of craziness. Part the, of it's media, though. I gotta interrupt you, Dan. Part of it, yeah, not all these stories are coming directly from front offices. Oh Some yeah, of and there's are, agents and so business so managers that's, and. That's, yeah, that's part of the that's part of the that's the, that's the dog and, and pony like show. But the yeah. fact anyway, continue. That, no, I mean the fact is, I mean uh, a year ago people were talking about would CJ McCollum be enough to get Julia Loco for now now the talks are a lottery protected first round pick and either uh, Alexis Aginsa or a Omar Ashik for the former number three overall pick. Uh, wow. Uh, that seems like a wee bit of a drop in value. Uh, I mean, what are the Sixers really getting out of this? They're taking on a salary dump, doing the the, the Pelicans a solid, and giving up Okafor for a late pick? I mean, we talked about this before. The Blazers have a late first-round pick and plenty of crappy salaries to go ahead and send their way. And I... <laughs> that to me seems like a no-brainer. Even if you don't really like Okafor, you can divest yourself from a bad salary and take a flyer on a former number three overall pick with a hell of a post game. Um, he can maybe be your your Al Jefferson off the bench, um, leading the second unit kind of a deal. If that's the asking price, I'm picking up the phone. Yeah, Ashik is. Nine point nine million this year runs up through twelve million maybe in nineteen twenty. So he's got a four year contract that may or may not be looking good at this point. But if if Portland's contracts are reasonable and tradable, he certainly is too. Uh Alexis has four point six running to five point two for the next three years. So he's actually a little bit of a cheap contract. But there's nowhere. I think you're right. There's nowhere near the talent level potential going back there. So yeah, what? It feels weird that Phil would be bargain basementing the guy at this point. If they are, though, you would say the Lasers should be interested in Okafor. Yeah, I mean, if 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 they're giving the guy away, there's, if there's one thing that Neil O'Shea has certainly been good on, it's these like flyer deals. Taking one on Ed Davis, taking one on Aminu, uh, a flyer second. I think it was a, a top fifty-five protected for for Harkless. Uh, there was another second-round pick involved in the deal that got the Blazers. Robin Lopez. I mean, those kind of deals. He, love or hate the guy, he has hit home runs on all of those kind of deals. Uh, so that's kind of a no-brainer in my mind. If if they're shopping the guy for that kind of value, yeah, yeah, Neil needs to pick up the phone. Because, I mean, if nothing else, you're getting asset retention and on a controllable contract, and you're freeing up a whole lot of space. Yeah, the dude can score. He can offensive rebound pretty well. He's not the strongest rebounder in the world, but he can give you some of that. Uh, defense. He's not giving you much. He's, but, he's basically Al Jefferson. No. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, that's all right. I mean, at this point, you take Al Jefferson, make you better On a in the short deal. run, and he's and he's young and he's <laughs> yeah. Um, so, given the choice, let's pretend that you had a choice, uh, and you could choose between Okafor and Noel for the Blazers. Oh, it's which Noel. one would you prefer? It's Noel by a mile. I mean, you want to talk about moving the goalposts? There you go. 
Which one would you like? Would you like the one that's a one-way player, uh, has lots of issues on and off the court, um, has showed no interest in playing real basketball? Now, if, if you're talking about oh, oh, you better hope he doesn't become a Blazer now. <laughs> people are gonna people are gonna tape tape hey, that one. Go ahead. I mean, the 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 guy has been sitting on the bench sulking. I mean, it, it, it yeah. is what it is. Now, if he came here and turned things around, I'd be all for it. But again, we're getting we're, we're talking about the, the different levels of cost involved here. For Okafor, if you believe the rumors, can be had pretty darn cheap. Noel, while it was believed his value was higher, I've seen now quite a few reports in the past week basically saying that Noel at most is going to command a mid to late first round pick, which is kind of ironic when you consider that people thought it might cost the Blazers, Alan Crabb, and that Cavs pick. So the value on these guys has really been up in the air lately. Um, but still, if you're if you're yeah, talking well, about a, a t- a fitting a team more perfectly, I don't think there's many guys out there that do so more more than Noel does right now as far as on paper. Well, you got to consider other costs too, though, and that Noel's going to get paid over the summer, where Okafor's still on his rookie deal for longer. So I think there's more of an opportunity there, cost-wise, salary cap-wise, yeah, to go for Okafor. I don't know. You know, I'm not complete. I, I like Malo. I believe either one would be a good pickup. I think Noel would be a fine pickup, a fine flyer um, to take at the at the right price. Obviously, that is almost a no-brainer. I'm not much more sold on Noel overall long-term fit than I am on Okafor overall long-term fit. I think I'd like either of them. I, I, I value Noel exactly in the ways you said pretty much, but I'm not sure that he's that much more influential as a player. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I might be tempted by Okafor's cheaper contract, given the situation the Blazers are in right now. But I just, long story short, I think either one of us would be fine with either of them. Isn't that correct? Considering the, the cost that, that that's rumored to be involved, yeah. <laughs> I'm... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, no worries. Well, and what do you make of the fact that the Blazers apparently are evidencing no interest in either from what... We've heard, and again, wouldn't necessarily hear that they were if they were keeping their cards close to the vest, which they should do. Um, if the Blazers aren't really aren't interested in either of them, if, say, the Pelicans get the deal done for one or the other, what does that say about Portland? They're standing pat, and they there's two, to me, at least there's two different ways this could be. This could be that they're standing pat, and they have a plan. They're going to stick by their guns, and they're going to wait till the summer. Or the one that I'm terrified of is that the management is sitting here doubling down and it's more about ego than it is about making the right deal. And well, how about talent analysis? Though? Yeah. I mean, wasn't this the team? I mean, if you believe some of the commentators around the time, you know, of the Andre Drummond draft, the Blazers were just low on him. The Blazers didn't didn't like him. And it's like, okay, that's Andre Drummond. Would you take Andre Drummond right now? I think I'd take Andre Drummond right now. Yeah, that's that's a guy that I that I wanted coming out of school. So uh, Would you take him over Okafor and Noel? Yeah. And their twins yeah. and their entire families? Yeah. Yes. All I the, think I all, would. all of the things. <laughs> so, Crappy yeah. free throw shooting at all. I, I would I would absolutely take it. Well, like that doesn't infest Portland's front court anyway. I mean, it's, come on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, like at what point do you say, okay, maybe the talent analysis isn't quite there? Although I don't think no, neither Noel or Okafor, frankly, are solid in the case as Drummond is. Uh, so I get that. But also the price to get them is not as high as it would have been to trade up for Drummond, apparently. So. Gosh, at some point you have to. How many missed opportunities can you take? I, I I can't personally. I can't. If New Orleans gets them on the cheap, I might blow a gasket for a little bit. Yeah, and the, New Orleans is incredibly active. The trade deadline. It, it appears um, they've engaged not only them but the Orlando Magic on Vucevic. So, uh, I mean, you look at both these teams in, in Portland and in New Orleans, who are kind of on the younger side and have roster construction problems, I guess. And it's a little bit strange to see 
New Orleans is the one that's that's more more active of the of the two. Um, at least that's the perception right now. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see how it plays out. We'll jump jump the gun, but boy, yeah. So, uh, what else? Anything else burning this week before we go? Yeah. How many games do we have left before the All Star break? What is it? Four, five. Uh, uh, All Star break. CJ's in the three point competition uh, because his vacation plans didn't pan out, which <laughs> tells you all you need all you need to know about this All Star weekend. I mean, it's, uh, I think we talked about is there a snub? No, there's no snub. Uh, mildly excited to see CJ in the three point competition. Hope he wins it since he's in it. I, yeah. I, I, is it getting a harder? Is it just because the Blazers aren't in it, or is it a harder sell over? Are, are we over the All Star weekend a little bit? Um, I don't think so. I, I think it's because the 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 Blazers aren't in it, and even when. LaMarcus was kind of getting that token nod and even Roy to an extent because they weren't really well known nationally, even though the brand was being pushed hard. I still remember Roy coming into the game. Um, that might've been New Orleans as well, where he took off from near the free throw line and cocked it all the way back. He ended up hitting the back rim on that dunk. But I remember the national media going absolutely nuts because nobody knew Brandon could get up like that. In those yeah. moments, well, and he always he dominated. He dominated the, the, those all star games. It's like, oh, this is going to be the Jim Pack in appearance and blah blah. It's not really that show. Oh no, Brandon Roy is going to step up. <laughs> you invite Brandon Roy to the party, he's going to be out. ready for some dancing. Yeah, and that was the <laughs> thing. Is it, I think they like with Brandon. They they thought it was gonna be like this cursory, like like the way they treated Lamarcus. All right, here's a few minutes, mm-hmm. uh, and then you're coming out. Brandon came in and was like, "No, man, I'm gonna ball out. <laughs> this this is how it's gonna go down." And I mean, he, he's breaking guys down off the dribble, driving to the rim and dunking on people. And I think part of what makes it special, at least for me as a Blazers fan, is when the um, the rest of these guys nationally get to see you know what's going on with the small market team in Portland and I think that that's part of what's missing and I think people nationally will get to enjoy that with with CJ and you know kind of speaking of enjoyment um 10,000 kids now total for Blazers Edge Night with when all said and done after we wrap this up so uh, I, I think you've got uh, plenty to say on how Blazers Edge Night is going to turn out this year, huh, Dave? Yeah, uh, we we sent 2,000 kids again, thanks to all of you, or we are sending, uh, and uh, congratulations on that, and thank you for that. Uh, already, people, it's really funny, because we have a f- couple extra seats now with the, with the late donations, and people are writing, and it's so funny, with the tentative, well, we have, we have, you know, like a a dozen kids. No, we really have 20, but, but we can pare it down to a dozen and we, we tell them, don't pare it down. We'll give you 20 tickets and we'll send the, the drivers or chaperones to. They're like, oh my gosh, you are kidding. And it's like, no. That's what, that's that's what, what, that's what this is for. <laughs> yeah, it's like everybody can go and create community. And you guys have created communities in these classrooms and with these uh, teams in, you know, title and underprivileged areas. And uh, it's just amazing, fantastic that we're able to do this every year. We thank you so much for doing that. Uh, as Dan said, this year, by my calculations, we will pass 10,000 uh, 10,000 kids sent. I think someone left in the comments section of, of the post of where we announced this that he remembers when it was just 100. And even 100, I mean, this thing started with one dude wanted a couple tickets or had a couple tickets to donate. And another dude said, yeah, I can take him. I have 16 kids and I, I can send two of them. And we did the same thing. Hey, can we come up with 14 more tickets? And we, and we came up with 100. And the guy who... Uh, the guy who took those first 16 tickets found, you know, 84 more people. And the first year we sent a hundred would last from 16 and started with two. Uh, and then it just grew from there <laughs> to 2000 uh, to 2000 a year. Now over the 10,000 mark, it's just, it's amazing. It's incredible. It's fun. It's unique. Uh, well, it's not so unique anymore. Cause I'll tell you, they're doing this in Phoenix. They're looking to do this in Orlando uh, and a few other places. 
So we started something. And that's the cool thing about SB Nation. Kids is, are now is, going to other games. We we all we all yeah, talk. All the different writers yeah. and editors and and analysts. We a lot of us get together for summer league. Um, we talk during games. We banter back and forth. We talk on Slack. So stuff like this, it it when you see how big of an impact it has, it it, it goes across and it impacts so many more people. It's it's crazy. And I just want to reiterate, not only like it's 2,000 kids, it's 10% of the Moda Center, folks. Like 10% <laughs> yeah, of the Moda Center is, is going to be screaming kids. I, I don't know how many of you have ever watched like a, a summer league game where the the summer camp kids come in and like fill like one little section and how just incredibly loud and awesome they are for the entire game. That's basically what this is going to be. It's going to be 2,000 kids that are going to be losing their minds for, for 48 minutes. And it's the coolest sight ever. And it's it's just really awesome that we have a community that we can commit to sending 2,000 kids. And it gets done. Yeah, absolutely. So we love you, and the kids love doing it. So thank you so much. And I think that's about it for this week. Uh, we will, well, the panelists, I think, will be here on the weekend, and then we'll be back with you next week, right? Oh, oh will we? Will we, Dave? Yes, we will, I think, right? <laughs> I'm planning on it. I don't know. I look at these schedules, man, and I just, I just. We'll have some more stimulating <sighs> stimulating analysis of one blazer win and three blazer losses for you. Uh, or mean, it'll be three, at- three wins and one loss, and. The team's back together well, we got again. one week like that. Yeah, I mean, just like, yeah, look, <laughs> Oasis got back together again. Oh, I'll, no. I'll, no, I'll they, leave it at this. No, they broke up. I want this team to do well. Yeah. I really do. But I'm, I, my ability to, to care about the game-to-game record, I think, has left me for the season, finally. So it's, 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 a, it's about building for the future now and, and, and learning and growing. But the... The, the the really small nuance that I was really hoping to see growth in, I'm just, it's not there anymore. <laughs> I, I think I'm, we're doing I'm good. I'm dead inside. I think we're doing, doing good just keeping down the snark. <laughs> so in any case, <laughs> for Dan Morag, this is uh, Dave Decker in another snarkless version of the Blazer's Edge podcast. We will see you next week.